Thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's a great honor to appear before this distinguished society. And I'm especially delighted to be here at a time when the society is honoring my longtime friend, Linda Greenhouse. And so this is a double treat for me to be here. The central question I want to take on in the remarks I'm going to share with you this afternoon is where did modern Western economics come from and why it emerged when and where it did? And to be quite specific about what I have in mind by modern Western economics, I mean what we typically call the first fundamental welfare theorem, which is the proposition that individuals acting merely on their own self-interest with no altruism or thought for others can, and under the right conditions, which we understand to be well-regulated markets, in competitive markets, make not just themselves, but other people better off. If you stop to think about that, that is a remarkable proposition, absolutely remarkable and especially coming after, oh, at least hundreds, if not thousands of years of concern over the effects of self-interest, uh, it's really very, uh, very profound. Now, the usual presumptions to answer this question are two. One is to point to Adam Smith and his great work of 1776, The Wealth of Nations, uh, Donald Winch, the foremost Adam Smith, scholar of our time, in my view, alas, no longer with us, hailed Smith's wealth of nations as what he called the fountainhead of classical political economy. And the second presumption is that because Smith himself and economics more generally were products of the Enlightenment, and we think of the Enlightenment as, among other things, a movement away from thought of a God-centered universe toward what we in our modern vocabulary would call secular humanism. Therefore, not just uh, the wealth of nations, but economics has nothing to do with uh, religion. And I think this was said best by Nicholas Philipson, alas, also not, no longer with us. Uh, Philipson was a Scottish uh, historian taught at Edinburgh. If you want to read a biography of Smith, that is about the work, not about the life. Uh, I think Nick's is the best one. Nick said that not just the wealth of nations, but Smith's entire project for a modern science of man was built on the foundations of the Enlightenment's quintessential assault on religion. And I don't think uh, Nick thought he was saying anything unusual. He was just articulating the standard view. Well, I'm going to accept proposition number one, but I'm going to reject wholesale proposition number two. And instead, I'm going to argue that Adam Smith's thinking and the entire Smithian revolution in economics was enabled by what was then a new line of religious thinking in the English-speaking Protestant world, in particular, a movement beyond the Calvinist basis that laid the uh, sense of the Reformation in the English-speaking world, and it was specifically a turn away from Calvinist notions of depravity and predestination. Why did this matter? I will argue that this enabled people to take on a more optimistic view of the human character and especially important, an expanded concept of the possibilities for human agency. Now, to avoid misunderstanding, right at this outset, let me make clear what I am not suggesting. I am not suggesting that anything in this had to do with the self-conscious intent of religiously committed individuals trying to bring their religious beliefs to bear on their professional writings. Uh, this, we, these men were uh, international celebrities within their own lifetimes. We know a great deal about them. Uh, Hume was a notorious skeptic, an opponent of any kind 
of organized religion. Uh, many readers of his uh, work then and now uh, think of him as an atheist. This, incidentally, was why he was never able to get a university appointment. Uh, his great friend uh, William Robertson referred to him as a heathen. Uh, Hume himself had a delightful habit of referring to Church of England bishops as retainers to superstition, his phrase, and so it would be absurd to claim that this had anything to do with religious intent on Hume's part. Smith was much more private about his uh, personal religious commitments, but my reading is that he's the same kind of 18th century deist that uh, well, they've been obscured, but the three gentlemen whose portraits were here before were all 18th century deists of that uh, form. So what then is the story? The key concept to which I'm going to appeal is one from Einstein, uh, who famously uh, argued that scientific thought is a development of pre-scientific thought. And in a subsequent paper, Einstein put it this way that we need to form for ourselves what he called a world view or image of the world, uh, built or developed in his original German. And the reason we need to do this is that the world is just too complex to analyze as it is. We can't make progress that way. We have to simplify the world down to an image of it in order to make progress in analyzing it. And importantly, uh, Einstein didn't think that this was merely physical scientists who worked this way. He pointed to painters, to poets, to philosophers. Smith, after all, was a philosopher. Now, am I right to uh, assign this principle to economists as well? Well, two of my uh, Harvard predecessors certainly thought so. Schumpeter referred to the pre-analytic vision the vision, that's Schumpeter's capital, V on the vision, not my typo. Uh, Schumpeter argued that each economist sits down with a pre-analytic vision before he or she even starts to do any uh, analysis. And my uh, dear friend whom I miss greatly, Ken Galbraith, famously said that economic ideas are always an intimately a product of their own time and place. And I'm going to argue that Smith's ideas were very much, and in a particular way, a part of his time and place. Now, what precisely was Smith's contribution? If we go back to uh, thinking in 1700 about matters that we call economics, although the word didn't even exist then, I would summarize it in the answers to three propositions. First, could individuals correctly perceive what it was in their self-interest to do? And the answer was mostly no. And that's why it was deemed necessary to run economies on a top-down basis. The French famously had their mercantilist system. The English had this big system of government-granted monopolies. Second, <clears throat> even if people could figure out what was in their self-interest to do, <clears throat> there was no idea that uh, their acting on their self-interest uh, bore any implication for making anybody other than themselves better off. And third, for this reason, acting on your own self-interest in the economic sphere was taken to be morally opprobrious. It was a vice. It was vicious behavior. If we come forward to 1790, I pick 1790 simply because that's the year in which Smith died, the answers are very different. First, can individuals correctly perceive their self-interest? Smith argued yes when they act as producers of goods and services. Smith was scathing about the stupid decisions that people make when they act as consumers, especially the rich. But in the mode of a careful mathematician who doesn't want to assume anything more than he actually needs to prove his theorem, Smith understood that making this assumption for producers was all he needed. 
Second, Smith absolutely had the first welfare theorem. He understood that if, under conditions of competitive markets, people act on their own self-interest, they will end up making other people better off too. And for this reason, morally, the moral opprobrium of acting on your self-interest in the economic sphere is just gone. The words vice and vicious do appear in the wealth of nations, but never, ever to refer merely to acting on your own self-interest. Now, Smith did, to be fair, head of intellectual predecessors. I've uh, listed a few here, both in France and in England. France is important because uh, Smith was living in Toulouse when he started to write the book and uh, spent uh, time in Paris as well and uh, knew some of these uh, people, especially Canet. Uh, Smith was clear that if Canet had still been alive, he would have dedicated the wealth of nations to him. Alas, Canet died a few years earlier, so he couldn't uh, do that. So we have to address up front the question of maybe these predecessors deserve the credit instead of Smith. Maybe people like me ought to think of Bernard Mandeville as the father of our discipline, or maybe uh, Pierre uh, Nicole. My answer to this question is straightforwardly no. And the reason is that even though these earlier people intuited the central idea of the first welfare theorem, they had no systematic explanation. Uh, they had no, it's like stating a theorem without proving it. Especially for this generation of intellectuals all trained in Newtonian concepts of system and mechanism that just wasn't going to fly. Uh, Newton's great Principia Mathematica had been published in 1687. By the time Smith was an undergraduate at Glasgow, uh, the book was part of the required curriculum at every Scottish university, also Cambridge, not Oxford. Maybe this is why Oxford lagged behind in scientific uh, endeavor for so long. But for this generation of Newtonians, if you didn't have some systematic explanation, if you couldn't point to the mechanism, uh, your explanation just wasn't going to get anywhere. Now, let me be uh, even more specific about Smith's argument in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, first, the desire for material gain is inborn and therefore no more morally opprobrious than the fact that we have to eat or breathe or drink water. Uh, there's this lovely passage in the book in which he says that uh, we desire to better our condition, and that desire comes with us from the womb and stays with us until the grave. And of course, bettering our condition could mean just about anything, but he immediately goes on to make clear that it's our economic condition we, we, he has in mind. Uh, second, at the center of this process by which the first welfare theorem works is the role of competitively uh, set wages and prices and with a strikingly Newtonian uh, flavor to the explanation. Here is one passage in which he's talking about how the price system works. Take a look at it. Notice how Newtonian the language is. The prices are gravitating toward what we would call today the market clearing price, not uh, a phrase that he had. Uh, sometimes things keep them suspended in the wrong place, like a war in Ukraine, for example. Sometimes they force them down, but they're constantly settling uh, toward the market clearing level. This is very Newtonian. Uh, third, these competitive wages and prices are just the outcome of impersonal negotiations motivated by self-interest, not altruism on in either side. And therefore, all of this is yet one more example of the familiar enlightenment principle of unintended and unforeseen consequences. Given this argument, Smith absolutely had the globally beneficial outcome of the private pursuit of self-interest carried out in competitive markets. 
this action was beneficial for the in individuals involved, it was beneficial for society, and this, of course, is what we know as the invisible hand, oddly, oddly, because Smith only used the phrase once in each of his books. He didn't make a big deal about the phrase. But, and here I want to uh, say something that I think uh, is very much in the spirit of what Glory was saying uh, earlier. This is where Smith's well-known opposition to potential impedimenta to the competitive market mechanism comes from, but, but, overall what impressed Smith was the robustness of this mechanism. He did not think of this as some hothouse flower that needed to be protected at all costs against any uh, encroachment on the market mechanism. And for this reason, Smith was willing to accept all sorts of interferences with the market mechanism. Uh, I've just, uh, here, I've listed a whole bunch of them. Uh, and let me uh, just focus on the first one. Progressive income taxes. Smith was straightforwardly in favor of progressive income taxes. Why? Because he thought it was only right that the rich should pay more in proportion than the poor. It was very straightforward. Uh, today, as you may know, 2023 is the 300th anniversary of Smith's uh, birth. In 1976, the 250th anniversary of the Wealth of Nations, uh, George Stigler famously proclaimed that Adam Smith was alive and well and living in Chicago. <laughs> Today, on the 300th anniversary of uh, Adam Smith's birth, I tell you that Smith is alive and not doing very well because he is being held prisoner in Chicago. <laughs> and I want you to help me do something to liberate him. So next time, I'm hoping, here we are, no, does this, well, it doesn't show up. Next time you see somebody wearing an Adam Smith necktie, I want you to walk up to that person and say, ah, I see you're in favor of progressive income taxes. <laughs> and my prediction is that the person, not having read The Wealth of Nations, as the vast majority of people who wear Adam Smith neckties have not, the person will have not the vaguest notion what you're talking about, but you will have done your bit to help liberate Adam Smith from his prison in Chicago. Now, the key question that I uh, want to address, now that we've uh, all agreed, I hope, on what uh, Smith uh, did, is what enabled Smith uh, to reach this insight? We've already talked about Newtonian uh, ideas of system and mechanism. Uh, Smith was well-trained in Stoic philosophy. His favorites were Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Stoic philosophy has a lot about natural harmony in the universe, so that if you do something to make yourself better off, it's only harmonious that it makes me better off too. Smith was a very observant man, and he lived in a commercial society in Glasgow, Edinburgh, London, Paris, and he was also an insightful moral philosopher, but I think there was something more involved, namely this transition in the religious thinking of the English-speaking Protestant world. I have in mind in particular the turn away from predestinarian Calvinism, which had many elements to be sure, but because we're talking about economics, not theology, I want to emphasize only three of them, one about human nature, one about human destiny, and one about the human purpose. In terms of human nature, Calvin famously taught that all humans are, in his phrase, totally depraved in character. Another Calvin phrase, humans are totally unable <clears throat> to do any good. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists thought that each person was born with an inherent goodness. As Locke put it, we each are given the candle of the Lord with which to know what is right if we will only use it. In terms of human destiny, 
uh, Smith and <clears throat> Calvin rather uh, taught that the decision of whether each individual is to be saved or not saved is a decision made not only before the person is born but before the world is even created and obviously therefore leaving no room for influence by the person's own choice or actions. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists thought that everybody is at least potentially eligible to be saved and that our choices and actions matter for this purpose. In the words of John Tillotson, who was the first Archbishop of Canterbury appointed after the Glorious Revolution in 1688, it is up to individuals to cooperate, to cooperate with the divine in achieving their salvation. And then finally, <clears throat> Calvin taught that the sole reason man exists is the glorification of God. Calvin had this great phrase that the entire universe is a theater of God's glory. And by contrast, the post-Calvinists thought that human happiness is A, and maybe even the chief divinely intended end. Now, Importantly, this debate was at its height in Scotland exactly at the time when Hume and Smith and their contemporaries were coming to young adulthood and therefore forming what Einstein would have called their worldview, what uh, Schumpeter would have called their pre-analytic vision. It was in the mid-decades of the 18th century. It started in England in the latter 17th century and then moved to the mid 18th century, came to America in the late 18th century, which incidentally many people, including me, believe is not unrelated to the great accomplishment of the three gentlemen whose picture was here, but that's another story. Now, why would this religious debate have influenced their worldview, their vision, especially since we know that they were not religious men? I'll quickly list three uh, reasons. Uh, one was just the centrality and multidimensional importance of religion in their society. Uh, religion was more important, more pervasive, more central than anything we know today. Second, the integration of intellectual life at, <clears throat> at that time, university faculties and curriculum, the intellectual life of Edinburgh and Glasgow. Here is a picture of what Glasgow University looked like when Smith taught there. One building. They didn't have the theologians hived off in a different building the way we do at Harvard. At Yale, it's even worse. At Yale, the Divinity School is a mile from the old campus, and moreover, it's up a hill. If you're going on a bicycle, you really have to want to go there. <laughs> Smith and his theologian friends all sat in the same building. And moreover, the faculty was small. Here is a listing of all 14, 14 professorships in the University of Glasgow when Smith taught there. He was the professor of moral philosophy. But look at what else. They had a professor of divinity, what we would call theology, church history, all in the same uh, group. The most famous of the Edinburgh Dining Societies uh, at the... Enlightenment was the select society, 31 individual members. Smith and Hume were, of course, among the original members. Uh, there, there were five Church of Scotland ministers, including their great friend William Robertson. Fascinating character. Robertson was simultaneously the head of the Church of Scotland and the principal, in our language, the president of the University of Edinburgh. It would be as if the president of my university were simultaneously the president of Harvard and the chairman of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. He isn't, he isn't, but William Robertson, <laughs> he, he, he isn't, but Robertson was. And then finally, the contentiousness of the religious debate. Uh, Thirty Years' War was as deadly as World War I or II relative to the size of the population. All of these uh, battles, uh, here's the, you know, we know about this, the, the, the 1745 uprising through these romantic novels of, uh, of um, uh, Walter Scott and all that. It was a mighty bloody affair, 
and some of it took place right outside of Edinburgh. They couldn't have possibly have not paid attention. And then, just to repeat, there is this substantive coherence between the more optimistic view of human character and the more expansive view of human agency. And these ideas were part of the worldview and vision that people of that time brought to thinking of the secular world. And I argue that, in effect, Smith and his contemporaries were secularizing the dominant religious thinking of their time and place. And even though the motivating religious impulse has passed, <clears throat> All of this is still with us. Today, economics is still about choice. What do we do in the first semester of introductory economics? We talk about the choices, the decisions made by families and firms. The first fundamental welfare is still, theorem is still the heart of our analytical uh, apparatus. And I think if you scratch any economist, you're going to get the same uh, expansive and optimistic view of human agency that Smith and Hume uh, exhibited. So my view is, yes, it was Smith. No, it's wrong to think this had nothing to do with religion. I think the turn away from predestinarian Calvinism had a great deal to do with it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
uh, was behind, uh, behind Malthus. Uh, I personally, now, now we're getting beyond the range of anything where I can claim scholarship, where I'm now giving a personal view. Uh, I find the role of Darwin uh, in economics to be unfortunate. And the reason is that it got all tangled up in the 19th century <clears throat> with the so-called so social Darwinists. And that, I think, uh, started off in a bad place and over time went to a worse place. So I thought that was all very unfortunate. Now you could say, well, couldn't we have Darwin have been influential without the, Dar without the social Darwinists? Uh, well, I suppose we could have, but that's not, that's not the way it played out. So my view is that the influence of Darwin on economists, uh, on, on, on economics, is, has not been a good thing. I, I wish there had been less of it. Again, to repeat, that's a personal view. Dr. Friedman, you and I have a deal that I get you to a <laughs> 4 o'clock Zoom. <laughs> so we will have to draw this to a conclusion, and I turn the...